The new Formula 1 season is just around the corner. The hype is building and it is never too late to step on board the hype train and look forward to what the season has to offer us. But my name is Varna, you can call me Vans, and these are the top five reasons you should be excited for the Formula 1 2023 season. So today I'll be going through five things that, in my opinion, are reasons that we should all be very excited for the season ahead. You know, if let me know if I've forgotten anything, if you disagree with anything I've said, or or exactly what's getting you hyped for the season ahead. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Counting down for number five, we have the F1 and the FIA drama. Now, F1 and the FIA have been feuding, shall we say, for a little while. Um, you know, they've been in numerous things. The F1 teams don't want a new F1 team to join the grid as it dilutes their prize pool. But the FIA is for it, and there are lots of debates and discussion going on. On top of that, we've had inconsistent penalties, the tractor incident where Kazi nearly crashed into a tractor, which he wasn't told was on track. Um, there's been new, the jewellery rule, which targeted Lewis Hamilton more than anyone else. There was complaints about the standard of racing, because after Silverstone, with the Perez, Leclerc, Hamilton battle, things were very forceful, perhaps overly so in the view of many drivers, with I think Sebastian Metal in particular at the time walking out of a driver's briefing. And I still think to an extent there is a little bit of mistrust between the drivers and the FA after Abu Dhabi 2021. And I know obviously bringing it up again, but I do think there is a lack of faith there perhaps now with that in mind. I think, you know, I think even Victor Martins in F3 thought he said he nearly, you know, he didn't want another Abu Dhabi 2021 when he won his F3 championship. And the situation isn't helped when someone like Mohammed Ben Suleim goes on Twitter and says, oh, we've heard reports of massively inflated price tags for F1, which, you know, causes a huge problem with the, you know, Liberty Media who own F1, you know, that's going to cause massive problems. Obviously, I know he's stepped back since from the day to day running of F1, but the tension from that is still there. And, it hurts the image of F1. And I think it's, it's yeah, it, it's, it's complicated. And I think really it's epitomized by the fact that they've restricted political statements by drivers. Now, the drivers have spoken out very openly about how this is concerning for them. And um, in my opinion, um, I find the ruling a bit odd. I understand their perspective to an extent of you have to, in case someone says something that they don't want F1 does not be associated with, which I understand. However, I also do think that everyone has the right to make themselves look like an idiot if they want to. So, you know, if someone was to say something very, you know, uninformed, then they have every right to do that um, and face those consequences. Um, and the real question is, how will this resolve? Will it just fade out over time? Which is perfectly possible, but you have to remember back in the 70s and 80s, I know it's a different time, but back in the 70s and 80s, there was nearly, a, there was a split between Pfizer, as it was known uh, as uh, uh, as it was known then, and Foco, which was representing more of the teams, and they tried to end up having separate championships. It didn't work out, but it's 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 not likely, but it's possible. I think it's something that could be a storyline throughout this season, and maybe cause some problems for the sport as a whole. Moving on to number four, we have the cost cap or the impact of it, anyway. So. I would put this higher, but I am fairly conservative to the extent it will this this will happen. But I think something you notice over regulation changes is that the teams start spread and close up. And I think we saw last year that the field spread last year was not dissimilar to 2021. Now I did some research and it said that the field spread was 2.8% in 2022 uh, versus 3.3% in 2021. Now, this is smaller, but if you exclude Haas, who were in a different league of, well, badness in 2021, then it was 2.1%. Now, this actually isn't that big of an increase. It sounds, you know, a decent amount, but it's not actually as much as you might think. And I think we see over time how the field spread closes. I think, you know, a great example is 2020 and 2021, where 13 people get on the podium, um, at, which is something before that never really happened, but the consistency in regulation meant that eventually the gains are diminishing for the top teams and the midfield teams can catch up. And I think this will be exacerbated by the cost cap. Um, so, you know, Red Bull, for example, they've got their cost cap penalty because they breached the cost cap last year. They've got the 7% reduction in CFD and wind tunnel time. 
you know, and you've got just other teams and, and they're limited in their spending, much like Mercedes and Ferrari, they're limited. They can't just spend their way out to a bigger advantage, you know, and I think we're seeing more teams now, especially reaching the cost cap. I think we're seeing Haas with their MoneyGram sponsorship, Alpha with the Audi influence. Um, and I think really the only team that isn't necessarily at the cost cap, as far as I'm aware, is Williams. And I could be wrong, but I believe that's the case. With all these teams at the cost cap, the field will close because they the lower teams will be able to use the money more effectively because they're used to operate on that lower budget. It will mean a accelerated close up of of the pack. So, you know, I'm thinking as well last year, you know, uh, Alpine and McLaren, um, they can bridge the gap to the top three teams that was there last year. You know, we had Aston Martin at the end of the season having all that momentum. They were they got 37 points um in the second half of that season which was actually the sixth most of any team so if they can build on that momentum then they can potentially close that gap too you know we've got williams did give up in 2023 quite early um after silverstone i do believe and you know maybe they can make some progress too i don't know how likely that is but it's possible i can dream alpha tari i don't think alpha tari will have a second season of mediocrity I want to say, because they were poor last year for their standards of the years before. So yeah, I do think the, that the field will close up. And I think that will be very exciting because I think when the field is close, you get more, more drama. Like think of 2012, you know, like you think of that year where we had seven different winners in the first seven races from five different teams. That's, that's just not, that just doesn't happen. Like, so I think really we can hope but I, I i the reason it's low down is because like i said i'm conservative for the amount this will happen i think we may see it in a year or two but this year we probably will see a gulf between the top three and the rest but we can hope for we can hope for more. so we've just talked about rules that are remaining the same so i think it's time to talk about things that are changing i think we have to talk about the the new and returning drivers we have to the grid and this is not to say we're going to not miss the drivers that have left, you know, Seb was truly a champion in every sense of the word. I don't think any of us can express how much Seb means to F1 fans. And we're going to miss Danny Rick for his positivity, although he's still about the paddock next year, of course. And we're going to miss Mick. He was a lovely guy and I just don't think he got the opportunity or the car to show what he can do. And I really do hope he can come back one day. But looking at the positive side of that, we have three new or returning drivers next year who are all exciting in their own ways. So yeah, let's talk about that. So let's start with Oscar Piastri, who is one of the hottest prospects that F1 has produced in years since George Russell or Charles Leclerc. And we can see his junior career. Like he won every single category he was in, in his rookie season. That's the mark of a special talent. I think as well, the Alpine drama really enhanced the, the hype around him because it was such a, a piasco that it really sort of blew up his image in a way that no one ever thought. And now there's even more pressure on him. And I think he's going to a team alongside a well-established driver like Lando. And I think it's a team that gives chance on youth. And I think there is a lot of potential for that partnership to be something special. Obviously the question remains, will he do, will he fail like Danny Rick did? I mean, I also think McLaren failed Danny Rick to an extent, but you can't deny that Danny Rick did not perform except on the odd occasion. So I think It'll be interesting to see what he does and how he is, especially compared to such a highly regarded teammate in Lando. Now, we talk about Oscar. We do also have to talk about Logan Sargent. Uh, Logan pushed him all the way in F3 in 2020. Now, he didn't win. They were equal on points going to the last race, but Logan had an incident where he ended up being squeezed by two cards and just being out the race. And, you know, while I don't think he's necessarily as good as Oscar, I think Oscar clearly showed he's a step above. I think he won his rookie season F2. Uh, Logan only got P4 well only um, but I think he sh to me I think he has shown that he is capable and I think that he will end up being a good driver for Williams I don't think he'll be Albon there's no way in this first season I will not expect him to do that but I think he'll prove himself given time to be capable and potentially very very good um, and I think on top of that we have to talk about the fact that he's American the F1 in a market in America is growing and I think Americans really do get behind the people that represent them. I think, you know, we've heard, we've all heard, seen the meme of Pulisic, Christian Pulisic is the LeBron James of soccer. Like that's, you know, obviously that's not true, but they get behind those people. I think that has potential for Williams for more sponsorship and America to grow it as a market. I think that's, that's in itself exciting, in my opinion, just 
the bigger F1 is, the bigger, the more we all get out of it, I think. And finally, we go to Nico Hulkenberg. Now, this was a surprising return for everyone, I think. I think we can safely say that we thought Nico's Rock Hulkenberg's career was not finished, but it was very much on its last legs. And I think he's been given a sort of, I want to say second win. It was probably like a third win, but he's been given a chance by, by Haas. And I think I understand why. He's an experienced driver. He's definitely a quality driver. I think we don't need to look far for that. Look at his super sub performances in 2020, you know, um, with you know, P3 in qualifying in the 70th anniversary GP at Silverstone, you know, with P8 in Nürburgring after qualifying P20, after hopping the car for qualifying only. That's a sign of a great driver. And I think in the early 2010s, he showed some great performances, pole position in Brazil 2010, and leading the race in 2012 as well, in Brazil, uh, on legitimate pace. So I think it's clear to see there's talent there. And it'll be interesting to see how he does and whether he can get big points, whether he can deliver consistently, whether he can even get that first podium, which I think he would deserve. Yeah. So, and also, how does he interact with K-Mag? They've never had the best history. Something to think about. So, I just talked about Hulk and K-Mag a little bit. So I think where better to transition into the in-team battles that we're going to get next year. Now, obviously, every team has their own story, I think. There are a few teams perhaps more bit interesting than others, but... You know, I'll give a brief overview of some of the, you know, short, small, some of the less dramatic ones, perhaps some of the ones where I think you could boil over a bit more. Now we look at Haas and Alpha and Red Bull. Like Haas, of course, K-Mag and Hulkenberg, there was that history, like I mentioned, but, you know, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. But I also think that perhaps is one of the less interesting storylines we're going to see from that. You know, we've got Alpha with Joe being very good towards the end of the last season. I think he was not at the level of Bottas, but I think he was showing that he can reach that level which I think is promising for him. I think he's definitely earned that second season in F1 that we all thought that perhaps he may not deserve at first. And Red Bull, um, you know, after Brazil last year with the team orders drama, is Checo going to bend to Max's will or will Checo put up a fight and will that cause problems within the team? Because Max is the number one. I think Checo, you know, will still to an extent have to because he wants to keep that seat in his team. Otherwise, Danny Rick is waiting in the wings. but. It would be interesting to see where that goes. So starting with perhaps a team with a more interesting story, as it were, we have Aston Martin, um, Alonso and Stroll as teammates. Now, Alonso just has gone from a team where he had a problem with his teammate crashing into him and having incidents to a teammate like Stroll, who has a lack of spatial awareness. And if they're anywhere close on track, that's a concern because, you know, he could overly aggressively defend and crash into him. And now, obviously, Alonso did recently say he's a future world champion. I wonder why he said that. So clearly, I mean, I think to an extent, Alonso is not being ungenuine. I think he does think Scholl is a good driver. But I also think that Alonso and him could come to blows um, on track. And I think as well, Aston Martin needs to deliver because we saw the momentum at the end of last year. But if they can't capitalize, then, you know, will Alonso stay? I think Alonso has given so many different places a chance. And it's never worked. He's made some terrible career choices. And I think, I think to an extent, he has himself to blame for that. But I think he's a very talented driver. I think Alonso, if that team's not good enough, will just bow out. And I think if Stroll gets on his nerves too much, that's, he's not winning that battle. Stroll is the team owner's son. He's not going to get rid of, be gotten rid of. It's going to be Alonso. And will he be able to stand it when Stroll is behind him and he's asked to let him through? I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I do think Alonso is going to beat Stroll fairly comprehensively, but only time will tell. Moving on to the battle of the Frenchmen, we have Alpine, Gazi versus Ocon. Now, their beef, shall we call it, has been well established. They're, the fact they don't like each other very much. I think, I think Tomo made a great video on this. I think uh, I'll link it in the description below. But you know, they, they, there's clearly some issue there, even though, you know, we've seen Alpine really try and push the fact that they're friends now. I think there probably will be some issue there. And I think, you know, we've seen Ocon be over, overly aggressive with teammates, you know, take Perez. I think, although I think Perez has some blame to take there, but Perez was very aggressive back then. And I think as well um, with Alonso, we did see him being overly aggressive. He just has a reputation and a habit of being that way. And especially with someone that he doesn't get along with, it might be a bit of a, might cause fireworks on track. 
I think Gazi as well has a point to prove because I, he, he's 2022 was a bit underwhelming. Now that's in part because AlphaTauri took a massive step back, but he, he didn't show the level we saw in 2020 and 2021. He, you know, the levels he showed were top five on the grid. He was incredible uh, in those two seasons. And I think it was a shame that we couldn't see that same Gazi in 2022. And I don't know if he feels like he has something to prove. And I think, but I think he might. So yeah, that could come to blows on track and off it if, you know, things get out of hand. Now, I've also already touched on McLaren and I think it's important we talk about them because, you know, Oscar and Lando, that's a young, exciting driver pairing. But Lando is the established number one. He will want to show why he is the established number one. He wants to put Oscar in his place. He wants to show that he's not just beating Danny Rick because Danny Rick was not doing well. He wants to show that he's being Danny Rick because he's that good. Oscar as well, he will have something to prove. It's his rookie season after all the hype around him. He'll want to show that he's earned that place and that he can challenge the best. So I, I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops over the course of the season if, you know, Lando's clearly demolishing him or if, if surprisingly Oscar is toe-to-toe -to -toe with him because he, I, think, I think Lando's got more to lose here. I think La if Lando cannot comprehensively beat Oscar, it, maybe it doesn't look good for Lando. I think it looks very good for Oscar, but it looks very bad for Lando. So Lando is a lot of pressure to show how much better he is. And the thing is, you could also kind of say the same thing about Williams with Alex and Logan. Like Alex is the established number one. I know mean, he's only been there for a season, but he's established number one. Um, and Logan is the new boy. And I have only to show, yeah, I can beat him. I wasn't just beating it that my teammate because he was Latifi. I'm beating him because I'm good. And I think as well, like Alpha Tauri, it's exactly the same. Yuki going into his third season in Formula One, Nick going into his first, he needs to show, Yuki needs to show anyway, that he's better than Nick. And I think there is genuinely a lot of talent there. And I think he needs to show that talent, otherwise he's gone. Like he will have had plenty of time. I think third season, this is it for Yuki. And I think for Nick, this is no pressure. It's his first season. No one's expecting that much. I mean, obviously the hype after his Italian GP performance last year was high, but yeah, there's really relatively no pressure on him. And we sort of round out the intra-team battles with the biggest team with any drama is Mercedes. Um, if at the top, I mean, we saw last year that George and Lewis got on very well. They were amicable. They pushed the team forward as a way great drivers do. And, you know, we saw that was very close between them. Lewis and George were very close in both qualifying and race pace. I think Lewis had the edge. I think Lewis, when they stopped experimenting on his car as much, definitely had the measure of George. I think George does a little way to go to beat and catch up Lewis legitimately. I think George did a fantastic job. Let's not take away from how incredibly George did. But I think Lewis still has the measure of him, but it's still close. And I think you have to ask if they're at the top this year, which they could well be, will it stay amicable? Will they be friends? Will there be another Lewis Nico situation? You know, will or Sebastian Vettel, Mark, whatever situation like Lewis will not want to be beaten again. You know, he doesn't want to be beaten again. He wants to show he's better than George. I think last year, as much as he doesn't care, I believe it, but I do think his ego is a little bit bruised. He does want to make up for it. Cause I think, I think he, I think he knows how good he is. I think he just wants to make sure everyone else knows it now. Um, and I think George will want to beat Lewis. I think he's hungry. He's young. He wants to show that it wasn't just a fluke. He wasn't just because Lewis was experimenting with this car or because, you know, Lewis had some bad luck or, you know, anything else. It would just be because George was better. And I think, you know, last year, even though I don't think he was, he could maybe show it this year. Like anything's possible. I think time catches up with everyone. And, you know, we can see Alonso 41 still doing his thing. And I think Lewis could do the same thing. He's one of the best drivers the sport's ever seen. So it'll be fascinating to see what this young blood versus old hand dynamic causes, especially if they're fighting for the championship. Now, before we get into the last one, please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and leave a comment down below if, on what you think. So now we have to talk about the most exciting thing that there is to look forward to next year. And I really hope I'm not jinxing this, but the prospect of a championship battle, not like last year where we kind of got a glimpse of it at the start and it faded away, like a good one. I'm not going to claim it's going to be like 2010 or 2012 or 2021, but perhaps an actual battle. And that's better than we got last year. Now, the reasons I think this is possible, Red Bull's cost cap disadvantage. 
Um, we saw them get hit with their penalty on the cost cap. Uh, and do I think it was harsh? No. Do I think it will affect them? Yes, but I don't know how much. And no matter how much it will affect them, it will still affect them enough that the other teams will have potential to catch up if they make the necessary steps. Mercedes have momentum going into this year as well with the rule changes to reduce porpoising potentially suiting them. And also on top of that, you know, we saw Brazil, they really closed the gap over the course of the year. I mean, over the course of the year, I think they closed the gap from about 1% to pole to 0.6% to pole, which isn't something to scoff at. That's a, that's a significant, that's nearly halving the deficit. And I think with that momentum in mind, if they can make it work on every track, then there's a, there are going to be a prospect with the dry lab dump they have. My only concern with that, obviously, is the fact that Red Bull in 2017 to 19 were always the same as what Mercedes could be. They started the season not so well, off the pace, caught up. And was like, yeah, next year Red Bull will be in the fight. Next year they came, they were off again and they had to catch up all over again. We have to hope Mercedes can really capitalise on the momentum they showed and really capitalise on the learnings they had. Like, we have to hope that Lewis's experimental setups weren't for nothing. And we have to hope that they can put a challenge to Red Bull if Ferrari falter. And speaking of Ferrari, they're on a new leadership. Um, you know, with Frederick Vasseur coming in instead of uh, Mattia Bonotto. And we all know that Ferrari under Italian leadership doesn't always flourish. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see if he can bring some stability and some needed change to the team. Because I think the issue is if you're Italian in the team, you're very involved. I think Frederick Vasseur is coming in from the outside is like, I need to do, I'm going to do what needs to be done. I think he's shown with... Sauber in the past and F2 as well, the how he can run a successful team. And I think that's something to look forward to. I think Ferrari will be under better management because I think their really their problem, problems last year were somewhat technical, but a lot were man, like management problems with the strategy and the sort of sort of uh, culture within the team. And sort of the final thing that may contribute to um the championship battle is the fact that really all the best drivers are there. The, the best drivers in the grid are in the right seats for the most part. So, you know, we've got Charles who has that rough edge that just needs to smooth out. Take France last year, just, just needs to smooth out those rough edges that show that he just isn't quite ready. I think he's getting better every year and I think that, you know, at some point he's going to be ready. And I think maybe this year could be it. You know, Max, I mean, Max is just ridiculous, isn't he? He's just in ridiculously good form and He's just an insane driver. I don't think there are already any on the driver on the grid that can match him on raw pace at the minute. I think Lewis is the only driver that can get close to Max. And I think Lewis and Max are just the best two by miles. And I think that's the other thing. Lewis wants that eighth. He wants his eighth title. He wants to avenge what happened in 2021 because, you know, I'm sure he feels injustice and I think he has every right to. Um, and, you know, George wants to show just how good he is. He wants to show that him winning every category in junior formulas was not fluke and that he's better than Lewis Hamilton and he's better than anyone. And I think that's, that's, I think there's no reason for him not to push. And I think Carlos has shown he's great. He's great, but I don't think he's shown he's got enough. And I think he'd be so desperate to show that. I think he will work harder than anyone to show just how fantastic he is. And, you know, Going, I'm guessing going through all the drivers, but with Checo, he wanted to take it to Max. I, I think is this is the thing with the way Red Bull is. I'm not sure if Checo will be able to take it to Max, but he will really he work hard to make sure to try and make it happen because Red Bull is a Max based team, and it'll be very difficult for him to challenge like perhaps the other five can. But he's there to pick up the pieces. So you never know. He could be integral to this world championship fight as well, like he was in 2021. Just the, the, the changes in the teams, the the drivers themselves, it just adds up to this just fantastically exciting championship battle. And yeah, I really hope you guys are as excited as I am for this season because it has so much potential and I don't want to be disappointed. Um, but anyway, if you have enjoyed this video, um, like I said, leave a like, subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you guys. Any of you guys who clicked on and stayed on this video for this long uh, means a lot. So, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one.